This week's episode is sponsored by... You know, I take a, a, um, a great deal of joy and pride in the fact that uh, I'm able to carry on this legacy and, uh, you know, hopefully someday pass it down to my children and they could do the same. And uh, that's a big part of, of what we do as far as the sustainable practices and the intelligent uh, use of, you know, technology and for agriculture and stuff so we can keep this thing going. The Rio Grande Valley is known for its citrus, and the grapefruit shines the brightest in the acres of orchards that cover this floodplain. Lone Star Citrus Growers is one of the several citrus harvesters in the valley that bring the bright red fruit to the local markets and tables, but not without the usual family operation running the behind the scenes. Located in the heart of Mission, Texas, Lone Star Citrus has integrated growing, harvesting, packing, and shipping into their vision. Judd Flowers, the president of the company, along with sons TJ, Michael, and daughter-in-law April, tend to both never-ending day-to-day big-picture operations, careers they devote to their lives in order to grow and change the role citrus can offer to consumers. Mike, everyone wants to know how fruit gets from the orchard to the store. So what do we have going on here? Sure, well, um, each crew is made up of all these guys here and, and they've all got individual sacks with them. What they're doing is they're climbing in and out, up and down the trees, filling up those sacks, and they just come over here put them in these big uh, field bins here. And once they're full to about this region here, uh, they're loaded up onto the truck and then taken to the facility. How long does it take to fill up one of these bins? Well, that depends on the <laughs> orchard really, but um, I don't know, anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half, just depending on how the picking is. It looks like it's pretty decent here. So um, we'll probably take 15 or 16 bags to fill this one up here. And so once they're take, this is full, it goes onto the truck and then it's taken over to the shed. Yes, ma'am. When we walk into a grocery store, we see all different types of varieties of oranges. Little ones, big ones. What type of varieties do y'all specialize in growing? Uh, okay, well, we've got four different kind of oranges that we harvest. Uh, these particularly are called pineapple oranges. Um, they're good because they're medium size. You know, we can, uh, they're good for what they call peel and eat. Also, they've got, as you can see, a ton of juice in them. Wow, Real good yeah. looking orange. Uh, we also have the bigger navel varieties. Um, and then early on in the season, or what we start off with, as far as our orange harvest is concerned, would be called a, a Mars orange or an early orange. And typically those are good for juicing because of the small size of the actual fruit. These are a little bit larger, as you can see here. Yeah. And so they just, because of the size, you know, they. Like I said, they call them peel and eat. They're easier to peel as opposed to a really tiny orange. It's beautiful. You guys at home want to see. I wish you could smell it. It smells so sweet. But I uh, wish I had a glass to make some juice. You can see that juice just dripping out. 
You weren't lying, were you? No, ma'am. Grand Valley is a special place, but it's also a special place for growing citrus. What makes it so great for growing grapefruit specifically? Uh, well, there's a couple things. Uh, first off, we got the soil. Uh, it's very conducive to growing a sweeter piece of fruit. Uh, the weather plays a big factor into it. Uh, we've got the warm days and the cool nights, especially around this time. It really helps with uh, bringing in the sugar and bringing in the nutrients through that soil to get these Great looking, great tasting grapefruit. Nice and red on the inside. So when do you know that a fruit is ripe? So bricks is a measurement of the uh, sugar inside of the juice. Okay, so once we have a specific uh, number or, or a specific concentration of sugars in the juice, the USDA will come in, do their own uh, independent testing, and once it meets their standards, then we can start harvesting it processing it and sending it to the store. And the harvesting in that whole process is the same as the oranges. So they just take it off the tree, put it in the bin, and then we go to the shed and do all that good stuff. Yes, ma'am. We come, we harvest. It goes from the tree to the sack, to the bin, to the truck, to the, uh, to the packing facility. Uh, usually on, early on in the season, we'll do what's called degreening process. But from there, it goes and gets washed and then processed and packed. Now, the Rio Grande Valley can tend to be a little dry sometimes. So with this orchard here, I mean, not just this one specifically, but all the orchards that y'all manage, how often do you have to water these plants? Normally we keep within a two and three week schedule of, uh, of watering. And one way that we're actually able to keep track of, of the water and even the nutrients that go into these trees is through a, a, an app and a system we call uh, AgSpy. Basically what that does is we've got a, a sensor that goes into the ground and it measures exactly how deep the root system goes and how much water the individual uh, groves are taking up. And through that, we can actually calculate the, uh, the ion absorption. And from there, we can extrapolate how much and how much or how little nutrients each tree is getting. And so through that, we're able to uh, manage our, um, our fertilizing and our watering to the T. Right, Mike so I noticed that not one fruit looks the same so we have some that looks green some that has a little bit of scarring does this green fruit mean it's not ripe yet and it probably shouldn't have been picked all right so if you see a piece of fruit of ours that's in in the uh, grocery store uh -huh. it has already passed the USDA's inspection um, for maturity or ripeness um, let's see this one compared to this one on the inside, there's really no difference. They've got a thick peel on them, relatively, and uh, once we've done those bricks testing like I was telling you about, it's the same for all of them. And so I noticed now, let's skip from the green looking fruit to the fruit that has markings on it, which we call scarring, correct? Sure. So a lot of times when we see like a banana that's bruised, we know not to get it because it's probably brown on the fruit. Does the same case follow for a grapefruit? No, no, and actually we picked a really good day to do this to, to show um, that when these, when these pieces of fruit are growing, and they're growing from uh, late spring into the summer, they're growing all summer, it gets windy out here. And so with that Mike, wind... let's be honest, we live in the valley, it's windy <laughs> every day. <laughs> yeah, well, pretty much. And so with that daily wind like you're talking about, you know, these little pieces of fruit are growing from about this big size of a marble into something like this, and they're constantly getting hit by leaves and by other stems and even sometimes by other fruit. And as a result, they're gonna develop this scarring. But I promise you, Michelle, it has nothing to do with what the fruit tastes like on the inside. In fact, sometimes I like to get the uglier pieces myself and eat those because they, uh, they all taste amazing. Well, I would think that the longer the fruit's been on the tree, the more scarring it's gonna have, so the better the fruit, right? In some cases, yes, ma'am. So 
and Mike. This is a ruby red, right? Actually, no, these are Rio stars. Um, back in the early 80s, after that devastating freeze, farmers wanted to start replacing the dead trees. And they actually started replacing it with the ruby's smarter, more attractive, better looking cousin, uh, the Rio star. <clears throat> Reason being is, is they're seven to 10 times redder, seven to 10 times sweeter than the other fruit. And so now, industry-wide, I'd say we've got about 90 to 95% Rio stars as opposed to the rubies, which everybody um, accidentally is asking for. Gotcha, so the Rio star, it's kind of like they shine bright in the Rio Grande Valley, right? They sure do, yes ma'am. Today, a lot of our agriculture is being decimated by the industry. So what are you guys doing as a family to sustain your orchards? Well, Michelle, at the end of the day, um, our livelihood is the land and you get out of it what you put in. So we try to concentrate on sustainable, responsible agricultural practices and also the responsible use of technology um, so that to ensure that we're not overburdening the land. Okay, and then we also um, try to market our product to a younger generation as well. Yeah, that younger generation, they're our future. Yeah. So you've got to market to them. Yes, <laughs> Agriculture isn't just a job, it's a lifestyle, it's a passion, it's either part of who you are or it isn't. You pour your time, blood and sweat into your land and livestock. Nobody understands that grit more than we do. If there comes a time when you need a helping hand, we stand ready. Local, loyal and here for the long haul. Internet is more than just uploads and downloads. It's about connecting people. VTX1 Companies is here for you, bringing communities closer together. VTX1 has connected customers for almost 70 years. Our internet service spans across South Texas to some of the most remote areas. Faster wireless service is now available in Palmview, Alton, West Laco, and FAR. Call 1-800-446-2031 or visit vtx1.net to find out more. Work on the ranch or farm never stops. From sunup to sunset and the hours in between, reliable machinery is essential and our Kubota products are the solution. Whether you need a tractor, loader, mower, or utility vehicle, Amigo Power Equipment has over 45 years of experience to get you into the Kubota that's right for you. Stop by today and let us show you all the great Kubota products and why Amigo Power Equipment is the leading Kubota dealer in South Texas. Be sure to ask about our $0 down and 0% finance offers too. Somehow, the humid and citrus-stained air is comforting knowing that these fruits are being taken absolute care of. Rooms dedicated for proper storing, conveyor belts constantly running the fruits down to be cleaned and separated, and packers fitting them into those classic and familiar mesh bags that we see piled up at the grocery stores. The processing plant is the final step before these gems hit the markets and tables. The work behind the curtain that gives quality and repertoire to this company. So Michelle, after your Grove tour today, one of the things that you noticed is that the fruit hanging on the tree right now is not necessarily completely co colored up. Some of it is still green. In fact, when we begin harvesting in October, that fruit is solid green hanging on the tree. So this room that we're in, this area that we're in right now is very important to our production uh, because this is the degreening area. We have 13 rooms that span the length of this building and these rooms are specifically dedicated to get the color of the fruit right. Whether it's solid green, full color, or any point in between, we have to make sure that that fruit is ready to be processed. So we put them in these rooms. 
sequestered from the outside elements, we heat up the air to about 85 degrees, and then we circulate that air humidified, and then we drop in about three to four parts per million ethylene gas. Ethylene, of course, is a naturally uh, produced uh, element within all citrus fruits, and it is uh, the agent that colors up all this fruit. So when we add a little bit of ethylene gas, it colors up the fruit faster. I'd like to show you some fruit sure. that we picked yesterday. Ooh, it's humid. Yeah. So Michelle, this is one of our degreening rooms and we have a couple of loads of grapefruit in here that were actually picked yesterday. Every load that we pick gets a harvest tag. It tells me the commodity, the variety, the grower, lot block and grove, and who picked it on what date. So each one of these tags in succession tells me everything I need to know about that harvested fruit. You can see that the uh, color on this fruit that was picked yesterday, it's still quite a bit green. So I'm gonna look at it tomorrow and it's probably going to take another day even after that before it's totally colored up. This is something that I would consider full color. So when everything looks closer to this shade of blush, then I'll pull it out for processing. So the conditions in here are just like the conditions Mother Nature provides. We've just man shifted it currently. That's correct. It's hot, it's humid. It's very humid. <laughs> but with the fruit off the tree, uh, now the ethylene that is naturally produced within citrus fruits goes to work and changes the outside color. Of course, we do add a little bit more ethylene to uh, reduce the amount of time that it takes to get the green out. green then it comes over here what happens here once the fruit is degreened then we start the production process that's where we dump the fruit on this line we take out all the small undersized pieces of fruit that go straight to the juice plant um, and then it goes through a system of roller scrubbers to get that fruit extra clean uh, we apply some water some soap uh, some sanitizing agents and we get the fruit nice and clean before it gets uh, pre-graded and then it goes into a dryer. After the dryer, the fruit is then waxed. Um, we put a food grade wax to seal in the freshness and then it also uh, gives that fruit a shine that people want to see on the grocery store. More appealing. That's right. On the manual pack lines, they can pack about a thousand cartons per hour. Thousand cartons. Thousand cartons. And how much does each box, each box weigh? Forty pounds, approximate. And there's a thousand cartons on a truckload, so each line of eight packers can pack about a load an hour. My machines pack it slower, uh, but uh, they're very efficient in terms of the length of the day. I can bring the machines in, start them earlier, and run them longer. Uh, the ladies come in, they pack very fast and get done. Um, the, some of the more difficult packs that the machines can't do. And how many people do you have on each line? Eight, on the manual line? Eight packers per pack line. Uh, I've got several banks of machines over here and I also have a bagging system. And one of the interesting things about bags is uh, it's a uh, very much retail, retail driven commodity. Uh, every major chain store in this country wants bags of grapefruit. We pack a three pound bag, five pound bag, eight pound bag, 10 pound bag, and we've got a machine over here uh, behind that accumulation bin that does it automatically. So we have to weigh each piece of fruit as it goes into a hopper, and then we use the individual weight of the, per, of the piece of fruit to fill up that bag. The most common bag that we do is a five pound bag. Uh, so we put eight five pound bags in a box and send that to all the major retail stores from Walmart to Kroger to HEB. TJ, we saw the greening, the cleaning, and now we're at the grading? The final grade, that's okay. correct. Yeah, so after that fruit has been degreened and then 
washed and then pre-graded, then it's dried, then it's waxed with that food grade wax I was right. talking about earlier. Gives it a nice shine. And then it comes out of the waxer right here. During production, this is when I have a row of graders on this side and this side. And what they're looking for now, being final grade, is they're separating the pretty fruit from the fruit that just tastes good and might not be as pretty. So they're separating fancy and choice. Fancy is a number one, choice is a number two. So as the ladies are grading, any fruit that they miss then continues on down to our fancy sizer. And I, that's where I have a bank of cameras that takes a digital image of every single piece of fruit, several of them actually, and it can tell based on those photos what has dark scar, light scar, too much green in the fruit, uh, or any other outside, outward defect. This is our loadout cooler. So every box that we pack goes into this loadout cooler before we put it onto an 18 wheel over the road truck. Uh, all of this product needs to be pre-cooled for a few hours before it's loaded. Uh, but interestingly, this room will hold about 40 loads in all of these racks here. You'll see down this line, we've got every single label that we pack on both oranges and grapefruit. All of this has now been prepared for shipment. Um, we usually pack between 15 and 20,000 cartons per day. Wow. Okay, so this room is pretty full right now because we're at the end of the pack day. But each one of these box, uh, boxes uh, uh, constitutes a packable unit. And so on a good day, we'll pack 20,000 of these uh, you know, during the peak, peak of our season. April, you are the unsung hero. <laughs> you hold it all together, whether you like it or not. Um, as far as the public sees. So you are in charge of marketing. Tell me a little bit about your job title. So I love my job. Uh, my job is to take our product and put it in front of the end consumer. So the mom or dad or the college kid or the grandparent who's grocery shopping on a daily basis. That's my job, connect with them and find a way to help them use our product in a, in a way that um, is enjoyable and hopefully new and inventive. I really love that part of my job. I work with a lot of food bloggers, recipe developers to really reinvent grapefruit. We want to bring it back to the table um, in a way that it hasn't been yet. Um, everybody thinks you cut it in half and you scoop it out and you can totally do that. That's fine. But there are so many other ways to incorporate grapefruit into your diet. And especially in today's society, everyone wants knowledge now. Knowledge yes. is power. They want to know where their food is coming from. And so that's a little bit about what you do. You're trying to educate everyone on how their food comes and the various ways that you can use it. Right. What is your favorite way to use a grapefruit? Hands down in a pico de gallo or with avocado. I love grapefruit and avocado paired together. But my second favorite is in a cocktail. There are too many great recipes out there. I'll take the there. cocktail. <laughs> With booming family business and constant analysis of future growth, Lone Star Citrus spearheads their industry and has no plans to stop. Bringing these juicy and staple fruits to more families and businesses is just one of the Rio Grande Valley's strong suits in the agricultural world. Growing up with uh, a father who was in the citrus business for 25 years at Heald's Valley and, and uh, 20 years prior to that uh, at other places, we, you know, we were uh, very familiar with the citrus industry uh, all through growing up. Uh, my brother and I both went to Texas A&M and uh, after we got our degrees, uh, we, uh, you know, I was a few years ahead of Mike and I actually took a job um, within produce but not within citrus. I was a, a in sales as a broker. And so that's actually how I cut my teeth in this business as a salesman by trade uh, that actually um, didn't really realize it at the time, but that would come in very handy with the family business that we would later end up starting together. So right out of college, uh, you know, j just as luck would have it, as uh, uh, opportunity presented itself, I was able to break into this business in sales. 
um, learned how to sell different commodities, um, and then came the fact where uh, you know um, there was an opportunity where my dad was, and where he needed a salesman, and I knew a salesman, and so we were able to match up in that regard. Uh, my introduction to the citrus business was a little bit different. Um, I when I first got out of school, I came in here and. I did everything from stacking boxes to driving forklifts to helping with the pack line and uh, running the auto line uh, system of grading and all that stuff. And then um, just kind of <coughs> weaved in and out of the different aspects of the business and then found my niche outside with the, uh, with the harvesting and, and here we are. It's, uh, it's really nice to be able to, to come into work every day and see my dad and see my brother and, and work hand to hand with them. And, it's just, uh, it makes things enjoyable, you know, being able to work with, with people that, um, that you love and care about and, and want to succeed. So yeah, it's, a, it's a nice part of this whole thing. Absolutely. What is your day-to-day -day operation? What do you do from the second your foot steps into the office? Basically, we try to have an organized plan two or three days out. And so the first thing we do every morning is uh, meet with the Grove Care operators at uh, the equipment barn and we line out the equipment that's going to be taking care of the grows for the day. And then after that's done, we organize uh, the details of the harvesting plan that we set before the afternoon before and then uh, we uh, come to the package shed, coordinate things with sales, and then that's that's the starting point. And then after that, when the plan falls apart, that's what you deal with <laughs> <laughs> every day. It's kind of like when the, the troops landed on D-Day in the wrong spot. <laughs> so the general mm -hmm. said, well, just start the war from here. So we have a plan to start with, and then we deal with it as it comes out. Well, we sure are happy that you allowed me and my team to come out and see your operation and see how well y'all function together as a family in order to provide for America. So not only thank you for letting us come out today, but thanks for feeding the world and thank you guys. Well, you're very welcome. It's uh, gratifying to have you come out. We're, we're always uh, appreciative to show people what we do. So thanks for coming. Yeah. God bless and have a good day. This week's episode is sponsored by 